Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. Welcome to our Seed Saturday program. We are very excited to welcome Anthony Marinello today. He's going to be talking about a native plant lawn and all of the work he did on his own lawn, which was featured in Newsday and was really amazing with all the attention that it brought to us. And I think that, uh, I mean, the attention it brought to him and uh, brought him to our attention. <laughs> and I think that there's a lot that we can learn today, um, but I was gonna say to Julie that, uh, the one who first first told us about Anthony. Yeah. Yes. I. I'm. I'm yes, because I met up him in Newsday, and and then I found him on Facebook, and he's just absolutely lovely and a real gentleman, and I just I can't say enough good things about him. And he's smart, and he. He's an advocate for native plants. And he's, he's started plants again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, and Rosa, I think that today is um, the day that we can start feeling like our Seed Saturday program has made it. I know. We've, <laughs> we've, we've made it. <laughs> Oh, and I should just say that everybody, if you haven't used GoToMeeting before, at the top of your screen, um, it usually says view everyone, but when Anthony begins, um, you can do who's talking, and it will just show his screen and the uh, presentation that he's going to be giving us. Um, thank you again very much for joining us, and welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Julia. Those are some nice words. Um, it's a tough act to follow after last week with Tal and me, but I try my, my best. Um, so let's get into, into it. Um, this is, I wanted to actually go over, since I'm sure Doug Tal and me went over just the general broad concepts with everybody last week, but I wanted to kind of bring it back down to Long Island, and I want to go over some things that will help homeowners grow a native plant garden or convert their lawn into a native plant habitat and tips and ideas and 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 um, techniques in order to meet to reach that goal. So with that, we'll continue with the slide. So problems with traditional turf lawns. Historically, they have their origins within the English elite. They're meant to portray wealth and social status. Um, you would have to have a lot of money and a lot of wealth to be able to have a lot of sheep to eat that graze on that lawn and keep it nice and tidy or have a lot of servants to do that yourself. And nowadays it's kind of just not really up to modern specifications, especially when you consider how much inputs have to go into keeping a lawn looking neat, neat and tidy. Um, there's a lot of manual labor involved, a lot of chemical fertilizer pesticides. Most of the irrigation that's used to water lawns are treated drinking water, which is a waste of treated drinking water. Um, and of course, it takes a lot of time to, out of people's very busy schedules, to have to maintain a turf lawn constantly. They're the source of a lot, a lot of pollution. The fertilizer, pesticides, and off, off it affects our soil, our groundwater, our local waterways. Uh, the South, South Bay gets, gets all, all sorts of brown, brown tides, red tides, all sorts of things on them. The fish die, die off. Um, last year, we had a shell die off, shellfish die off on, on the North Shore. Um, so, a lot of what we're putting into our ground is affecting our water and we're kind of lagging behind on Long Island realizing that as a one big coastal community between the four counties that call Long Island home. Um, for instance, Queens I think still dumps sewage, raw sewage into their waterways that also flows into our base. Um, so with all that we get ecological dead zones, the toxic environment that is your lawn doesn't support any life. Most of the turf grass species themselves are from Europe and Africa and don't occupy the a niche in our own local ecology, and they're largely aesthetic. I know a lot of people who don't ever step foot on their front lawn. They don't mow it themselves. They hire somebody to come in and mow it. They don't play games in it. They don't do anything besides look at it. So if we could take that wasted space and turn it into something that functions, something that benefits people besides people, but wildlife, 
and cleans up the earth as we're doing it, I say go for it. So the benefits of a native plant garden, they require little to no inputs. Native plants have evolved to withstand the harsh conditions nature created. There's, you don't need fertilizer, you don't need pesticides. Supplemental irrigation is not needed once the plants are established. Weekly maintenance is replaced by seasonal maintenance once or twice a year. So that saves a lot of time for people who have busy schedules. They keep the toxic chemicals out of the, the environment to begin with. So there's no remediation because you're just not putting the chemicals down. So you don't have to clean up our waterways. You don't have to figure out ways to filter the water going into the drainage because the native plants are absorbing and filtering the rainwater through the soil with their roots, absorbing any chemicals themselves if there is pollution in, the, in that runoff and preventing it from getting into our waterways and causing problems. Native plant gardens foster life, both human and wild. They create habitat for wildlife, including songbirds, pollinators, beneficial arthropods. And I say arthropods, not beneficial insects, because I like to include spiders in that group. A lot of times people don't include spiders, but spiders are very important. They keep a lot of our pest species at manageable levels. Um, they provide beautiful yet functional green space that lives in people as much as they learn wild wildlife. It's, it's a great learning opportunity for, for children. I have, I have children from all over the neighborhood come with their parents to watch the butterflies, look at the birds, watch the frogs in the pond, you name it. They just like to come, pick strawberries, watch strawberries out of the garden. They like to, to have snacks when they come. Um, so it's really quite an attractive place for people and it's a welcoming place for people and wildlife. It also reconnects people to the land. Every season, almost every week, something's different. If you look at a lawn and you take a picture of a lawn throughout the seasons, unless there was snow on the ground, you almost wouldn't know what season that picture was taken in. But with the native plant garden, you know what month you're looking at because different plants are blooming, different plants are growing, different plants are dying back. Um, and a lot of these plants are probably ornamental. So that's another thing that people don't, there's a uh, falsehood with that where people think that wildflowers are messy or unmanageable and then the wildflower flowers make up are actually invasive species from Eurasia or Africa that grow along our roadsides because they're disturbed areas and that's where they, they that's just growing so they colonize those disturbed areas. Meanwhile our native plants are actually very ornamental, very manageable if you know what you're not dealing, dealing with and very functional in the environment. So where do where do I begin? You, you want to get on, you don't know, know what to do. So this is my a section of my front, front yard. Uh, um, you can see there's a stone border in the front. And hold on, I'll turn on the pointer. So you can see there's a stone border in the front over here. This is the little bit of lawn, lawn that I did leave. You'll see some more pictures later. Um, so there's all sorts of different layers in here. There's a nice low layer of violets and wild strawberries. There's some Indian grass, some switchgrass, um, all sorts of milkweed mixed in here. So where to begin is right outside the coast. We have three major ecoregions on Long Island. The Long Island Sound Coastal Forest, Cape Cod Long Island Ecoregion, which is Pine Barrens, and the Barrier Island Coastal Marsh Complex, which is along the South Shore, which includes all the barrier islands, the sand dunes, also the salt marshes that take place that grow along the, the, safe, the, the South Bay, the Great South Bay. And so you have the dunes on the ocean side, and you have the marshes on the sound side, the bay side. Um, it's important to know which ecoregion you reside in and to choose plants that are native to that region. A lot of plants have ranges that it go, you know, besides just Long Island, maybe they go down south to Virginia is, or they cohabit in more than one ecoregion. So it's important to figure out which plants make up plant communities in your own ecoregion and then strive to replicate that community within your garden. So I'll give a quick example. Um, pitch pine, it grows all throughout our pine barrens but it also grows in our Barrier Island Coastal Marsh complex, mostly in the sand dunes. So while pitch pine would be growing in the pine barrens with oak trees, it will be growing with something like beech plums or um, prickly pear cactus along our Barrier Island ecosystem. So it's important to know which communities, which community you live in and strive for those plants to make up that community. So here's a map. Of Long Island with the three ecoregions labeled for you. Brentwood, I have a little arrow for you. Right here is where Brentwood is, right above Iceland. So this would be the Cape Cod Long Island 
Pine Barren ecoregion, which extends from some consider it actually parts of New Jersey all the way through Long Island and then up to Cape Cod, which is the Pine Barren ecoregion. Up here to the west and the north shore, much of the north shore of Long Island is the coast, coastal sound, the sound coastal forest. And to the south, along the south shore from Brooklyn and Queens, Jamaica Bay, the Great State, the Great South Bay through here, all the way to Monto Point is the Barrier Island Coastal Marsh. And those are up the ecoregion. So you can just have to figure out which ecoregion you live and which ecoregion you need to be striving to meet. Um, some do's and don'ts of native plants, because there is a long list of mistakes I have made that I would like to prevent other people from making. Um, there's a trial and error involved with native plants. But if you know what you're doing and if you do your research properly, you don't have to worry so much. Um, okay, so learn the botanical names. It's very important to know the botanical names so that you know the plant you're looking at is the plant you're looking at. A lot of times, they will be sharing a common name with another species, whether it's a na another native species or a species that is completely not native at all. Um, so one, or they'll just have like a marketing gimmick. So one that I like to talk about the most since we are on Long Island is Montauk Daisy, which many people considering the name think that it's native to Long Island, but it's botanical name, Nipponicum, 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 is a botanical name. Um, you're not speaking Latin, obviously. <laughs> that is the historical name for Japan. So outside of the Northeast, it's common name is Japan Daisy, but here we call it Monsko Daisy, and many people assume that it's native here, but it is not. Another would be Black Eyed Susan. There's three native Rudecia species that people will refer to as Black Eyed Susan. So it's good to know which one you're speaking of. So using the botanical name during your research and even during the purchasing of your plant is very important, especially when you then consider that Black Eyed Susan vine is an African species that is grown as an annual as an ornamental. So you definitely want to know your botanical names. Research the natural ranges of your plants. There's many tools available online, there's many databases. Um, there's many groups on Facebook. I'm just going to share my own group later. Um, so many of our longtime native favorites people plant in the Northeast, such as Rebecca, um, Echinacea, so purple coneflower, black eyed Susan, they actually are not native to the Northeast. They're native to the Midwest, and Southern Midwest area. Um, so you should really focus on planting native plants specifically for our ecoregion and the Northeast region. I actually reached out to Doug Calamy recently, a few weeks ago, to kind of settle that debate because in my own Facebook group, um, we were having trouble figuring out how far away we should do a cutoff for which plants we can consider for in our garden because we're gardening, we're not restoring an ecosystem per se. So we're trying to have a little fun but not cause any more problems than everything else has already caused. So the calendar you recommend to keeping your plant collection within 100 miles of your ecoregion. So beyond that point, you really want to cut back and stop planting plants that may not be native anymore. So there's many maps online, there's many databases. I'm going to share a few of them later for people to, to do their own research and find out which plants are native and which plants are not. Okay. Research both how the individual plant grows and matures, but also how the plant reproduces. Some of these plants can be very aggressive in the home garden. Um, a lot of people like to plant milkweed. They say, oh, you know, plant milkweed for monarchs, milkweed for monarchs. If a, a suburban homeowner plants it common milkweed or a giant goldenrod is the other example I gave, um, these plants, they colonize empty space quickly. So planting them in an empty garden bed is going to lead to them expanding their their, their root base and their, they send out runners underneath the ground, so rhizomes and runners. So what's gonna happen is they're gonna colonize that whole space quickly and they can kind of go out of bounds and they can appear aggressive and then they can appear sloppy. So what you wanna do is you wanna choose plants that are going to fit your needs. So while those two plants may be perfect if you're on a hillside and you wanna stabilize the hillside or if you wanna outcompete invasive species after you cleared them away, they're not always the best choice for a smaller home garden setting where you want things to look neat, you want things to look tidy, and you want them to stay where you plant them. Um, so plan your garden and keep records. The most important thing you can do is plan, plan, plan. Many 
species have an extensive root system where they have very large tap roots. So once you plant them in the ground and they establish, you're not going to be able to move them around if you don't like where you put them. Obviously, it, you know, there's some options where some plants can be moved and they don't care, but something like artesia, once it's put in the ground, or if you let something like pokeweed grow, it's not gonna be moved after a couple of years. It's gonna be there for good, and you're gonna have to either kill it, replace it, or end up killing it trying to move it. So it's just not worth it. So plan your garden, make sure the plants that are up front in your front border are gonna stay small, they're gonna stay well behaved, and they're not going to get overly grown or flop over. And so plan, 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 so that you don't run into any problems. And research as much as you can. Don't, don't choose cultivated varieties. Many cultivars are hybrids. Um, they've been bred for a certain characteristic that the breeder finds, you know, worth breeding. Um, any plant with a nickname in quotation should be avoided because that usually means that it is a cultivar that's been named, that has been bred. Um, anything with an X within the botanical name means that it is a hybrid. So recently, the past couple of years, the big box stores like Home Depot have been selling these, they're really great looking Baptisia, um, wild blue indigo, but they are hybrids. They're coming in colors like yellow, like smoky orange, weird colors of, of blue that aren't natural. And many of their tags will say Baptisia X. The Baptisia X, the X refers to a hybrid. Or it may read Blueberry Sunday right here. So that would be, that's a cultivar in quotations, and you should avoid that. The other issue with hybrids is that they're often sterile, meaning there's no pollen for pollinators, no seed or fruit set for songbirds. So they're not nearly as functional as a straight species would be. And you might as well at that point be growing, you know, just to put a plastic plant in your garden at that point if it's not functioning. Don't, don't change the reproductive anatomy, anatomy of your plants. Any change of flower, flower color structure as a shape, a shape should be avoided. This interferes with the special insects ability to, to utilize the plant. Double variety varieties, they block access to the pollen and the nectar, so insects can't get in. So it may look neat to us, to humans. Oh, look at this, it's a pom-pom type flower, but it's useless to insects and doesn't provide insects or birds with any sustenance. Larger fruit is another thing where it looks more ornamental for us. A lot of times our native holly, winterberry holly, is there, there will be cultivars available that have larger fruit sizes. And while it looks more ornamental for us, it causes issues with birds in the winter who are trying to eat it because they're just not designed to eat something that's been messed with that's so large. So they prefer a smaller fruit that they can more easily manage. Leaf color can also be an issue since studies are showing that when purple leaf varieties are planted, the normal host, the normal insects that would host on that plant are not able to utilize that plant anymore. They cannot digest the change in leaf color. The chemicals in the leaf structure itself is different. So those should be avoided as well. Don't just stop mowing your lawn and let nature take over. I know there's a huge push every May for no mow May. I'm not a fan of no mow May. Uh, many times you'll end up with just a big patch of non-native invasive weeds. Um, it looks messy, it doesn't look organized. It kind of gives the pollinator garden, native garden, a bad name. Your neighbors will definitely be upset with you as well. Um, so try your best to, like I said before, make a plan and purposefully and intently plant your garden and design it properly. Don't just let everything go and say, oh, I'm, I'm doing native gardening. That's not what it is. Um, don't take on more than you can handle. Start small, identify invasive species on your property, remove those first. Research which plants are suited for your ecoregion and your growing conditions. Focus on one bid. You can always expand from there. Research is key. Nothing can beat the knowledge of, you know, getting your hands dirty, planting the plants in the ground, and just taking a year to just watch how those plants grow. Once you know how those plants grow, you'll be a lot more confident than just saying, you know, I read online that it gets this toll or I read online that it needs this much sun. You'll know exactly how it's going to behave in your garden, and then you can expand that bed. You can convert your whole lawn at that point because you'll know how these plants are going to grow and how you, what you need to do in order to make them look their best and function their best in your in your garden. Another word on cultivars. Some cultivars I do consider acceptable. I know other people may not find this this uh, might not agree with this. Um, so for example, Little Joe pieweed, Eutrochium dubium, Little Joe is a dwarf 
species, a dwarf cultivar of our native Joe pie weed. Um, it's not hybridized, as you can see by the name, but it's just a dwarf specimen of species that is vegetatively propagated to retain the dwarf stature. So that means that they take cuttings of the plant, they root them out, and they grow them from the original plant that they found. So every single plant is a clone of the original plant. So it no, so there's no genetic diversity. So if you plant out a field of little Joe, you're going to have literally just a field of one, one plant, one genetically ident identical plant, which isn't the best for resiliency in the long term. Those genes can flow back into wild populations and cause some issues with the wild populations. But when you're in the urban environment and you're in a suburban environment, sometimes cultivars, in my opinion, can be useful. Um, there's also improved varieties. So Monarda, which is bee bomb, or garden flocks, they tend to get powdery mildew. And there's a lot of varieties now that they're named cultivars, but the main thing is that they've bred mildew resistance into the plant. They haven't messed with plant structure at all. They haven't messed with the flowers at all. They've only changed the resiliency to powdery mildew so that it doesn't become infected and so that it always looks its best within your garden. Always research the cultivar before choosing to include it in your garden plans. One thing I think I skipped before was the, I'll just go back real quick for the names of your plants. It's a genus and a species. So always look for a tag with a genus and a species. If the tag doesn't have genus and species, don't buy it. If you're going to Home Depot, you're going to Lowe's, even a nursery, if the tag just says, it may just say the genus. So we'll use the Baptisia again. If it just says Baptisia, but doesn't provide you with the species name, put it back on the shelf and find a different plant because you don't know what they're selling you. It could be a hybrid. It could be a cultivar of some sort. You just don't know. So unless it specifies what species it is, it's best to avoid it. Okay. Okay. So now you have some theory, you're doing your research and you want to put it, put it to practice. So th this picture is a garden I installed in Rockville Center a couple weeks ago. Um, this was a lawn conversion where I'll show you, this is the stone border where the lawn used to be. It's a very small area and the woman wanted to have a native plant garden that she wouldn't have to maintain. She's an older woman. She didn't want to have to be paying landscapers to come all the time. So we converted it for her into a native plant garden where this we ripped out all her invasive Japanese hollies. We replaced them with native inkberry hollies. We ripped out her Japanese maple and replaced it with a a weeping red form of red bud for ornamental purposes. I know we just spoke about why we should avoid the red leaves. And then we put in some low growing grasses in the front, some flowering perennials behind there, including some butterfly weed and some tick seed some switchgrass in the back and the inkberry hollies in the back. So altogether you have a bird sanctuary, hosting capabilities for insects and butterflies, and the seeds and the flowers will support insects and birds throughout the season. So the simplest thing to do is to work with the beds you already have. You can always remove your non-native domestically invasive species and replace them with native plants. But for those who want to reduce their lawns, and the deck that comes along with them, there's a few things you can use to reach those goals. Once it is lawn conversion, which you can use sheet mulch to do, it's the easiest way to do instead of ripping out your lawn piece by piece, you can simply cover over it and plant right into it. You can start from seed. A lot of times what people will do to start from seed is they'll start with a fresh bed. They'll remove everything that was growing in that bed. They'll put down some plastic, they'll solarize it over a few months, kill off everything, and then plant directly into it. Another option for people who have large properties with extensive lawns um, where you really wouldn't fit in, especially the, uh, the ritzy communities, call them, where you wouldn't fit in if you, if you converted your entire front lawn into a native plant garden. It may be worth looking into island gardens where within the lawn itself, you have small pockets of, of maybe prairie or Wildflowers here and, and there. So you have an island gardens throughout the lawn that you can actually walk through and meander through, and that can look quite attractive as well. So, convert a lawn. The number one technique is sheet mulching, also known as lasagna gardening, for those who use this technique to grow vegetables. Um, the goal here is simply to work smart and with nature. A layer of cardboard, newspaper, or other um, 
biodegradable material is layered on the existing lawn and then covered with at least two inches or more of topsoil, compost, or mulch. Over time, this will smother the existing lawn and return the nutrients to the soil, which the new plants can utilize. It's often the quickest method and also easier on your back because you're not ripping anything out, you're not digging anything, you're just covering over and just spreading mulch and, and topsoil. It's best to wait a few weeks to let the lawn die off, but many people have had success just layer everything down and planting directly into it immediately and watering in and your plants will grow right from there. So as you see, there's a nice little picture of someone in the process of expanding their garden bed and covering over their, their grass. Island gardens is another one. So island garden, gardens can be great formal actions within a larger ecosystem. I see by this picture, someone has you know, a huge hedgerow, a large property with a lot of grass, but they wanted to remove some grass and reduction of a lawn of, is better than doing nothing and just keeping your lawn. So even a small island garden filled with native flowering perennials, grasses, shrubs, even as maybe a small ornamental tree can actually add a lot of curb appeal, a lot of um, ornamentation to the space and can look really great and function really well as well. Okay, so solarization. Um, this is starting a meadow or a prairie from seed. This is what's commonly done. Um, you'll cover over a garden bed or, or turf area with either black plastic or clear plastic and weigh it down. And pretty much you let the sun cook it. You use the solar radiation to help sterilize the soil. Um, a lot of times when people are starting native plant beds from seed, the issue is that there is such a seed bank there's such large numbers of dormant seeds within the seed bank that they can no longer that in order to to germinate their own seeds they end up having to weed out all these other seeds that they don't want growing especially long island having you know almost five six hundred years of colonization from europe existing on the island there is a lot of different plants that will grow but whether it's a native plant that's a weed or considered a weed or if it's just um, a European species that would used to be farmed, that that's just hiding in the soil, waiting for someone to turn it over and be be stimulated to grow. So by doing this, you help sterilize the soil. It'll kill off all those dormant weed seeds. Um, one one example of a weed seed that likes to stay dormant, it can stay dormant for over 30 years, is purslane. Um, so that's another one from from Eurasia that um, used to be grown as an annual edible, and now it's usually just a patio weed or a garden weed. And again, those seeds can stay dormant for 30 years. So you don't want to spend the time and the money planning out your garden and throwing down wildflower seeds only to have a mess of non-native invasive seeds grow with them. And then you have to go in and pick out each little plant that you don't want there. So the other thing with this is fall sowing. So you would cook your soil pretty much the entire summer. And then fall is the perfect time for both planting and sowing. Um, native plant seeds. They get a nice cool moist period followed by a dormancy period followed by another cool moist period to establish before they have the heat and the drought that comes with the summer. Solarization and starting from seed usually leads to a more naturalized planting because you don't have so much control over where each species is growing. You kind of just toss the seed down and wherever they germinate, they germinate. So this is great for maybe backyards or small little areas that you wanna make a little meadow that looks very naturalistic, but it may not be the best choice for if you're doing something in your front yard where you want curb appeal and you want to stay organized and, and neat and maybe have a little more formalization happening in the space. So some tips for homeowners to keep your space maintained, your neighbors happy and your gardens functioning at their peak is always include borders in your plantings. Borders are the number one thing to, to focus on because they ensure people know that the space is planned, whether you're using stones, a hard edge in the garden bed, ornamental fencing, or the plants themselves in a planted border. As long as you have that delineation between the garden and the surrounding area, whether it's a pathway, whether it's a little section of turf lawn that you're leaving, Whatever it may be, you just need that delineation for people to accept that this was a planned planting that you're using and not something that was left to just do its own thing. Pathways through the garden also help achieve this while inviting guests to come into the space. So 
a garden that you can only look at from one angle is great, but if you can actually walk within the garden and become part of it and see the intricate workings that are happening within it, that's always great too. So I like to include pathways throughout the garden so that you can enter the garden and it's a very welcoming characteristic then when there's a pathway through. Children will come through, you can invite guests into the garden who want to come view the wildflowers, to view the butterflies, to view the bees. It, it adds a little more appeal to the space. Include signage. You can't be out in the garden all day educating the neighborhood about your garden. So the next best thing is to certify your garden with one of the various national or local level organizations and to purchase one of their educational signs. Displaying that sign will help people understand that again, this is a planned space. There's purpose here. You didn't just let things grow out of control. You planted these plants where they're growing and there's a purpose to it, whether it's a monarch way station, whether it's a pollination garden, whether it's a songbird garden, they'll understand better and they'll accept the space better. And they may even be more interested than in doing it themselves if they, if they have a sign explaining what you're doing. Decorations, water features, statuary, including these within your garden also help others understand that it's a planned purposeful garden. Natural materials, including stone, wood, they, they stick with the theme of the natural native planting, but they can add whimsy to the space. So driftwood, maybe some stone animals like some cats or something, because I know a lot of times people will plant native gardens to attract birds and they end up with a bunch of cats ending up in their gardens because that's just what cats do. But yeah, it's a little whimsy, maybe some uh, wind chime, something like that. Water features are also highly attractive. And again, that'll allow people to understand that it's a planned space by having a water feature, fountain or a bubbler. People and wildlife love to see moving water. It adds a little life to the garden too, when there's always a little bit of running water running through it. And it's a much needed resource for a wildlife that is far and few between in the suburbs where they may have to traverse houses or roadways in order to find a fresh drinking water. So that's also very appreciated by wildlife. So start from the ground up with a ground cover, followed by grasses and flowering perennials, shrubs, small trees, and then large shade trees and vines. Trees and shrubs are some of the most are some of the most important and early flowering plants for pollinators and many of our shade trees like oaks and cherries are unmatched in their hosting ability. So a lot of times people are struggling in the early spring. They don't know what to plant that will flower and provide nectar and pollen for the earliest of our pollinators like our bumblebees. While spring ephemerals are really good and they will emerge flower and then die before the, the strength of the sun in the summer. A lot, a lot of times our, our trees and our shrubs are overlooked. So our native willows, our native um, dogwoods, blueberries, those are really great early flower perennial shrubs that are very important for our early emerging pollinators that, that need that source of nectar and pollen immediately upon emerging from hibernation. Rethink, rethink pretty. Traditional spring and fall cleanups are a thing of the past. Fallen leaves, dead stems, and other detritus harbor all of the insect life that will overwinter in your garden. So you should gather all of those leaves, all that, all that debris from your, from your lawns and your pathways, and, and layer them directly in your garden beds. Leave the dead hollow stems on your perennials through the winter months. This is where all of those insects, all of the eggs, the cocoons, are, and even actual adults are hibernating within those hollow stems. So if you remove those, the, the, those insects are now removed from the system. And a lot of times that ends up in the landfill or being burned. So that's another thing you want to keep them where they, they fall, keep, keep all the insects and the beneficials where they are, they are and allow them to overwinter garden. And leave the seed heads alone. A lot of people like to deadhead seeds or they cut down the stems. If you do that, you're removing all the bird food. So you're literally growing a better bird feeder. I'm sure some of you have heard that before. Instead of putting out bird seed, you're growing the bird seed. So by leaving the seed heads up, you'll see the birds come in, they'll, they'll feast on your seeds starting in late summer, and they'll continue to feed on your seeds all the way through the winter, depending on which plants you have planted. Um, special care, again, being paid to the borders and the edges. These plants can be cut back if they're along the edges, in my opinion, 
Um, and then what you do is you just bundle those up and you put them towards the rear of the garden. So that way, at least the front and the edges of your garden look maintained through the winter months so that people don't walk by and say, oh, why does this look like it's just a dead, dead brown field or something like that? At least then you have a little bit of maintenance happening up front and you're still having the full functionality of leaving those stems and those leaves in your garden so that you're not affecting any insect numbers that you don't want to be affecting. Um, you should wait until late April to cut down last year's growth. Um, I usually like to wait until I at least see the bees actively foraging in the garden and you'll get a feel for which bees are the ones nesting in your stems after a couple years of, of gardening. A lot of times you can um, cut the stems down and within a few days you will see these tiny little bees actively nesting within the hollow stems that you left standing up. So leave those about 12 to 18 inches high to allow, or even higher actually, 18 to 24 inches is, is even better if you're going to provide nesting habitat for native bees and other beneficial insects to nest within those hollow stems. Another tip is to plant densely. 12 to 18 inches apart for most perennials. This leads to a plant community to form as it would in nature, where there's little or no empty space between the plants. This keeps out weeds that you don't want within your garden. It holds, it helps retain soil moisture. It helps prevent soil erosion and it helps prevent soil compaction. Um, this will lead to greater resiliency for the entire planting as a whole. And will actually look better as everything grows in because you'll have one lush planting instead of a plant here, some wood mulch, a plant here, some wood mulch. And you'll just have a more natural feel and a more functional environment at that point. That also allows the plants to act as their own mulch. So some further reading, if you haven't already, is Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, Nature's Best Hope, also by Doug Tallamy. A third book that was co-authored by Doug Tallamy is The Living Landscape, Designing for Beauty and Biodiversity in the Home Garden. Um, another one I enjoyed was A New Garden Ethic, Cultivating Defiant Compassion for an Uncertain Future, which is a book by Benjamin Vogt. And I quoted him earlier with the Rethink Pretty. He's out west and he does a lot of prairie plantings and he's a very big um, native plant activist and gardener. He's a designer, he's a gardener, he does some great work. Um, Planting in a Post-Wild World, Designing Plant Communities for Resilient Landscapes is a book by Thomas Rainier and Claudia West. And Great Natives for Tough Places, which is a book by the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. And that's an all-region guide. So again, it's a great to start with, but you should really focus on our immediate ecoregions if you're doing your native planting. Some common natives for Long Island to start with. On your research would be butterfly weed. I've also provided the botanical names. I'm not going to try to pronounce them all because I'll butcher them all because again I need to take a Latin class. Um, so butterfly weed, switchgrass, New England blazing star, eastern red cedar, our native oak trees, and wild black cherry. Um, so the butterfly weed is really important for our pollinators. It is actually recognized by the Xerces Society for Environment for Invertebrate Conservation as a high importance plant to our native pollinators. Many different insects and many different between the pollinators, but also the beneficial insects such as wasps and um, hoverflies love the butterfly weed flowers and they also host monarch butterflies as well. Switchgrass is another great one. It can literally grow pretty much anywhere and it grows almost everywhere on Long Island. Um, it's it's really great. It, it's very attractive. It's a very stately grass. It's a very ornamental grass. It looks great any season, whether it's growing in the spring, in the summer, or you're leaving it standing through the winter and it's covered in snow. It provides great nesting opportunity for our native insects that nest within the hollow stems. It provides great seeds for songbirds. Same with the New England Blazing Star. It's another great nectaring plant and it's a great source of seed for songbirds. Eastern Red Cedar is another high wildlife value plant. It's an evergreen. It's another one that you can find growing pretty much everywhere throughout Long Island. Um, it's a great understory plant, but it can also grow into a taller tree if need be, but you can prune it back as well. Um, that's a great plant for habitat, both 
nesting opportunities for songbirds in, in the summer, but also to keep them nice and warm through the winter because it is evergreen, it's very dense. It also provides food for um, songbirds with the berries throughout the winter and the other months. Our oak species and our wild black cherry, as I'm sure Doug Tallamy went over last week, they host some of the most highest numbers of butterflies and moths that you could post. And that's very important for our songbirds that need to feed their, their, nest, their nestlings. Um, so community and sourcing. The Long Island Native Plant and Gardening Group is on Facebook. Um, it's a great little community. I started that about a year ago this month and we're up to over 2,600 members already. It's a great place to go. You can introduce yourself. You can talk about what you want, who you want to attract, whether it's pollinators, butterflies, songbirds, rabbits, anything. And we'll get you on your way to, to meeting those goals. We're a very great community, open community, friendly community. We want to help you grow native plants and we want you to spread the word about native plants. Um, Another place is the Long Island Native Plant Initiative, which is actually their founder's plot is right in Brentwood at the Sisters of St. Joseph. Um, they always need volunteers. They're having an annual plant sale sometime this year. Um, they usually have an annual plant sale. I know some years they've been delayed or they've had to postpone it. Um, ask your local retail nursery to carry native plants. Request plants from Glover Perennials, Long Island Natives, Pinewood Perennial Gardens. Those are three local growers on Long Island that specifically grow native plants. And they need nurseries to carry their plants. And our people who want to grow native plants need the nurseries to carry those plants. So if you can go to your nurseries and ask them to contact those three nurseries about their native plants and to get those in stock, that would be great. And it would allow other people to come into contact with native plants even and, and just see what they, can, what they can be growing on their own property besides just what is standard in the nursery industry today. Um, I also am able to get native plants, so I'm offering that as well. Um, my company is called Native Landscapes. I offer home delivery of native plants. You can email me at this address, and we can figure out ways to get some native plants in the ground for you as well. Um, and I think that is it for my slides. Um, should we do the Q&A? Great, we have um, some questions that people have typed. The first question is, uh, was which, um, I think I think it was milkweed, MW are you planting? Which milkweed? Yeah. So butterfly weed is a great milkweed to plant. It stays as a clump. It doesn't spread out, it won't overtake your garden. Um, the only, Thing about butterfly weed is it tends to be a heavy seeder under the right conditions but again once you see butterfly weed in person whether or not that's a problem is up for debate because the, the flowers are very ornamental and very bright so the more the merrier in my opinion um and terry had asked uh curious to know about your background the education and experience how did you get interested so I've always been interested in wildlife, in um, songbirds, butterflies. I um, spent a lot of time in the garden as a kid. I spent a lot of time upstate running through the forest and just rummaging through local creeks and stuff up there. Um, I, I did study biology in college and then I went to the Center for Bioregional Living and I got a certificate in permaculture design which I use those principles in my native plant designs because permaculture is replicating natural ecosystems for both human betterment and the whole world pretty much with permaculture. So that's where I get um, my background in. Um, I'm just very passionate. This is a passion for me as well. So a lot of my research is done just because I choose to do the research and I want to know as much as I can and I wanna share as much as I can with other people. Another question was, should I deadhead Minarda? I don't. Um, if it's early enough in the season, you can and you can get another bloom. Um, it's more likely, instead of just deadheading the Minarda, you're more likely to get a second bloom out of it if you were to cut it back by two thirds, especially Minarda is one of those plants that will get downy mildew. So it helps around, you know, if you start seeing the downy mildew pop up or even if it already bloomed and now it's 
um, around the July 4th time is when it's recommended that you cut back some of your perennials, so by two thirds. And um, so you don't have to deadhead the Monarda. And like I said before, it's best, especially as we get later to the season, to leave those, those um, flower heads standing so that the seeds can be enjoyed by our native songbirds. Uh, 2D asks, is there a way to eradicate Japanese knotweed without using glyphosate? Not that I'm aware of. Um, Japanese knotweed is one of those plants that simply, once it's there, unless you poison it or really try your best to dig it out, which is almost impossible. The issue with Japanese knotweed is you may be looking at a stem in front of you, but the roots may extend you know, cross your entire backyard. So you may rip up that little bit of root ball that's attached to that stem, but it's just gonna pop up somewhere else. I've recently seen new work being done where people use stainless steel mesh and they layer that over the pokeweed patch. And pretty much what that does is it girdles the pokeweed, uh, not the pokeweed, it, it girdles the knotweed as it grows. So you're, so pretty much it burns the, the goal is to burn out the rootstock. Um, I have not seen if it's worked yet, um, but knotweed is one of those plants that is, it's, it's tough wherever it is. Both it's, it's tough in England, it's tough in North America, it's tough everywhere, but we have not figured out a way to remove knotweed without using chemicals yet. And is pokeweed native? Yes, pokeweed is native. Um, pokeweed actually, they use the ink to sign both the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. So it's a historical plant as well. Um, pokeweed is commonly used, or used to be more commonly used down south, especially in springtime as a edible green. It is highly toxic though. So unless you know how to properly prepare that, I do not recommend that you try eating it. Um, the dish is poke salad, if you wanted to look that up. Um, there's even a song about Poke Salad, Poke Salad Annie. I forget who it's by, but it's an interesting song. Um, it's a great native plant. It's great for our native pollinators. The flowers are always covered in bees and flies. Uh, and it's also, um, it's very ornamental. It's very tropical looking in my opinion. The, the red and purple stems are very ornamental and the dark purple berries are ornamental. And I like to grow that right outside. I have two large pokeweed plants that I grow outside my window and Every year, the mockingbirds, the robins, and the catbirds bring their fledglings to it, and we get to watch them from the from the window feed their their chicks and and teach them that pokeweed is food. If, if anybody has any other questions, you can also um, unmute yourself and talk if you'd like. Um, okay, here's one. I bought a plant labeled A tuberosa but it's tall and has more red orange flowers. Are you familiar? I was going to post it in the group, but since you're here live. Um, a lot of times, butterfly weed has a lot of variation between the colors of the flowers. They can be a deep, deep orange to the point where it's almost red, or they can be lighter orange, or they can be bright yellow. Um, but it's always a possibility that that may have been mislabeled and it may in fact be a tropical milkweed. So that's something to look into if, if it may be a tropical milkweed. I think I know who Terry is if <laughs> in my group, but um, so that, that may be an option too, that it may have been switched out with tropical milkweed. So you may want to compare that online to a picture of tropical milkweed and see if that's what you have. Two related questions are how invasive is pokeweed and how do you control the pokeweed in your garden? I don't have to control the pokeweed in my garden. Um, one of the things, a lot of people end up saying this to me, um, the pokeweed again is only in, like aggressive if, well actually let me go back because I see how invasive is pokeweed. Um, I don't refer to any native plant as invasive. If it's native to the region, by definition, it cannot be invasive. Um, so we'll refer to it as aggressive. It can be an aggressive cedar. So the problem with that is if the space is open, if there's open soil, you may end up getting a lot of pokeweed seeds popping up. But my plantings are so dense that I rarely ever get pokeweed seeds germinating. And if I do, I can quickly just spot them and pull them out. 
Um, so that's the main thing. You have to cover all your soil. Once you cover all your soil with native plants, plants that you don't want are not going to pop up because they're the soil is shaded. They're going to outcompete anything that wants to pop up. And you know, if something does pop up, it's easily pulled. Should I go outside and give a quick tour? Oh, that'd be great. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. One second. Are you able to see? Oh, yeah, yes. Okay. So the lawn stein back this year because we didn't have any water in May or June. And I'm planning on converting the little bit of grass that I have left actually to a native, um, either purple love grass or creeping phlox. Um, I'll, I'll just show quickly from the front. We're getting some uh, woodland sunflower starting to bloom. Some Rebecca Herto, Black Eyed Susan. This is New England Aster. This will bloom in, in late August or September. Some new additions this year are some New England Blazing Star, which most of the time people are growing dense Blazing Star. This is Liatris scariosa instead of Liatris spicata. The main front ground cover is a mix of wild violet and wild strawberry. I have some garden flocks. This is a dwarf variety of garden flocks, which actually was a volunteer from other plants that I no longer have. This is another great species of milkweed. This is world milkweed, the Sclepius verticillata. It only gets about two feet tall, has these nice little dainty white flowers. We missed, missed big, big bloom last week with, with my butter, butterfly weed, but this is the butterfly weed patch with all the echinacea. As you can see, the butterfly weed is starting to go to seed. It's starting to fruit up. Echinacea is growing nice and tall. The yarrow flowers are about to be sent. I may, may cut back and let them regrow and, and bloom again. again. Wild chives I grow, both for culinary purposes and because it's a nice early spring bloomer for pollination. And uh, just right bright color early in the spring. Some, some nodding in is starting to bloom. Pretty pear, pear cacts na native to Long Island. Many people are, are surprised to, to find you have, a, have a native cactus. Some pine, I think it's a Virginia pine. Some native prairie willow, which is a great willow for dry spaces. Again, flowers very early and it's a great insect hosting plant. Some tick seed. The signage, the signage is what's very important. Of course, mine's being blocked by my sunflower, which these now have been germinating on their own in my, and reproducing in my garden for over seven years now, just on their own. Um, so I have a few different certifications for the garden. It's a monarch way station. It's a pollinator habitat through the Xerces Society. And it's a certified butterfly garden through the North American Butterfly Association. So the heat today, as you can see, is making some plants wilt a little bit but they'll bounce right back. That's uh, some Monarda fistulosa, wild bergamot. I have beech plums. I'll find some here. They're drying up over here. It's not a good year this year just because it's so dry. So last year I had a few beech plums. You can see they're kind of drying up on the, on the plants this year. But you could just see how dense the planting is and you don't see any soil. So you just see the Rebecca, this is brown-eyed Susan, Rebecca triloba, which is starting to flower. So this entire space is going to be filled with yellow flowers soon. Um, we'll keep going. We got some, what is Culver's root? Blooming for me first time this year, these white flowers. As you can see, there's some insect action on there. Got switchgrass behind it, some winterberry. This is a cultivar of white pine. So Pinus strobus is Eastern white pine. It's one of my favorite trees. Um, I opted for a columnar cultivar because I wanted to plant it closer to the house and I didn't want to have to cause problems with the neighbors with any branches because the uh, white pines tend to 
have very large lateral branches that sometimes fall down, especially in snowstorms. This is a cultivar of switchgrass, which again, always go with the straight species. And our ecotype for Long Island is actually one of the most attractive switchgrass varieties. So this is a female winterberry starting to fruit up. So they're not red yet, but they're on their way. And the mockingbirds just devour this as the, you know, right away early in the season, all these. By, by January, there's no more berries left on my plants. Some swamp milkweed. I have six or seven different species of milkweed growing in the garden. And there's some aphids in there. I don't know if it'll focus. But a lot of people freak out about aphids. But aphids support a whole host of other insects and songbirds that, so I like to leave them in the, you know, I don't freak out about aphids. They, they do their thing and they're part of the food chain just as much. Some, uh, another species of Rebecca, Lacinata. This one's actually edible. This one used to actually be cultivated by the Native Americans to be eaten as a, as a leafy green. So that's another option. A lot of our native plants are edible. So that's why I actually have wild red raspberry. This is a, a yellow or a black, I forget which one I planted, variety of wild raspberry, black raspberry. Canadian yew. A lot of times people will plant hybrid yews or English yews. This is a Canadian yew, our native yew to New York. Not often for sale. So that one, you really got to look hard to find. And some some big blue stem is starting to go to flower. It's sending up its flower stalks. Some more milkweed. If we're lucky, maybe I'll find a caterpillar to show you. Some compass plant. And this again, so this is a super tall compass plant. I cut it back this year for the first time. So these flowers aren't growing as tall. This one actually is not native to the region. This was when I was still learning about the different resources to find out where the plants are native to. Some of them aren't always the best. So the USDA website, the plants database, isn't always the best resource to use. Um, the New York Flora Atlas is a great tool. That's through the University of Florida, ironically. And wildflower.org is another great tool to use. Um, this is Northern River Oats just starting to flower. So this whole patch over here is under my eastern redbud tree, which is covered in pink flowers all through the spring. And now it's providing beautiful shade for my woodland garden, which consists of woodland strawberry, northern river oats, some ostrich fern. There's a whole bunch of different spring ephemerals that bloom in this area, but now they're gone because once ephemerals bloom, they go dormant for the year. Um, some mountain mint. Mountain mint's a great pollinator plant. And I'll go over here. I have some mixed, I have some non-natives mixed in here because they're uh, like apples and asparagus. But um, this is native wild mint, mentha arvensis, that just started flowering this week. And this is covered in pollinators and will continue to be covered in pollinators until it stops blooming. Some bumblebees. Wild lobish blueberry. Another great one, great ornamental color in the fall, great flowers in the spring. You get berries, the birds get berries. It's a win for everybody. And again, uh, this is Dense Blazing Star, commonly sold all throughout um, the big box stores all the time. Uh, Liatris spicata. So that one's blooming while the New England one is not blooming yet. And for those who wanted to see my pokeweed, this is my pokeweed this year. It got very, very big this year and helped shade out the house, which actually helped a little bit with uh, the air conditioning. But um, I let it grow because as you can see, the redding is starting to redden up the stems and these stems will turn bright red. And as the redness goes through the stems, these berries will ripen. And these berries I find very attractive. And so do the songbirds, the mockingbirds, the robins, the cardinals, they all come to eat this. Right now the mockingbirds, are having a ball with my wild black currants that are ripening up. You can see the little berries. They're, they ripen into a nice dark black blue and they've been picking them before I got a chance to even get any this year. Some more mountain mint. Rebecca fulgita. Some wild senna, another great plant. 
for pollinators. It has some nice ornamental seed pods, some nice tropical looking foliage in my opinion. There is a banana, but we'll ignore the banana. <laughs> um, some cedar, eastern red cedar. And we'll go back through the garden one more time over the through the pathway. Here's another columnar oak that I planted because again, I wanted it near the house. Um, I believe this is a columnar pin oak. So I wanted this near the house and I didn't want it to cause any problems with the driveway and the cars. So I opted for a columnar specimen. Um, the other trees in there are in pots. Everything's in pots in this garden. That's in with the, the mint. And of course, this is my wild roses. They're not blooming right now. I cut these back last year. So this is Rosa virginiana. This is the rose species that should be growing all along our coastal sand dunes, but instead Rosa rugosa has been planted out by the government and then it became invasive. So the, the birds started helping them plant that out. Um, so this is what would normally be found growing on Long Island in the sand dunes. And again, I cut this back hard last year. So it usually would be about four feet tall. Some native honeysuckle. This is trumpet honeysuckle compared to the invasive Japanese honeysuckle. This one's great for our hummingbirds and also our bees do enjoy it as well. And of course, the pin oak. Oaks are one of my favorites. And like I said earlier, they're one of the most important species for hosting insects. So they were included in my planting, along with some wild black cherry, which a bird planted for me. And I've been keeping it nice and dwarf so that I have room for it. Otherwise, I have to remove it. So I also have a water feature in here, which there are some bullfrogs in here. There's a little waterfall behind all those irises in the back, and you can see some lesser cattail. There's some blue vervain right in front. The native plants, the plants that are in the water as well are all native. So there's some, um, let's see, there's some, um, I can't think of this name. All right, we'll go with the irises first. So there's lesser cattail. There's both northern blue flag and southern blue flag in here. There is our native impatiens, which is jewelweed, orange spotted jewelweed. Um, frogbit. This is our native frogbit, North American frogbit. And marsh marigold. And some more swamp milkweed. And you can see there's a wasp in there. And he's looking for those aphids that I showed you before. He's going underneath where the flowers are to hunt for aphids. And this morning there was actually, uh, I came out, there was a bunch of different swallowtail butterflies flying around. I had a monarch this morning. Here's that yellow milkweed I spoke about. That's called Hello Yellow. And that's actually a cultivar that is open pollinated. So it's not a clone. It's true to seed. There's a skipper on that echinacea bloom over there. So starting in July, when things really start starting to bloom is when you really start to see the most life in the garden. Lots of insect life, hoverflies, bees, different kinds of pollinators. This guy's a little different. All sorts of different things. Wasps, the, the mountain mint in particular brings in so many different kinds of wasps that you've never seen before until you plant mount, mountain mint. It's really quite spectacular. This is a uh, wild yellow ground cherry. So this is in the tomatillo family. It's related to our tomatoes and our potatoes. This is native to Long Island and it's very good for our, our um, bumblebees. And then it creates nice little fruit in that little paper lantern type thing. So in the seed pod, so that is very ornamental as well and provides food for wildlife from the fall through the winter. So I'll take a step back and try to get as much in the frame as I can, but you can see just, you have to plan it. You have to have a border. My border could be cleaned up a little bit more. I've been a little busy. But compared to the rest of the neighborhood, where it's just grass, my garden stands out. My garden has become an attraction in the neighborhood. People come from other towns. They walk here to, to see my garden. Um, I come out often and there's people just walking through it or watching it. I also have a certification from the National Wildlife Federation. And, you know, getting a sign like this, a real metal sign from an official organization like this, really lends credence to what you're doing in your space. 
and helps people fully understand the purpose of your garden. So I really wanted to take the time to uh, to help people specifically on Long Island because I know it's a very, you know, we're, we're the birth of the suburbs here. So I know a lot of people have a strong mentality of what, you know, people's front lawn should look like. But I just wanted to offer some tips and advice on how you can do it. You can, you know, convert your lawn and not piss everybody off and actually make a lot of friends in the neighborhood and my garden actually kind of created its own community both online and in the actual neighborhood that i live in i know a lot of people that i wouldn't have known just because i planted a garden so any other questions that people have seen you guys have seen some of the things if people were having a few questions um one question was are the sunflowers um a native plant so sunflower, Helianthus annuus, there's some mixed information online about annual sunflowers. Um, it's a domestic plant. There are wild, uh, there are wild annual sunflowers. Um, this is what I grow are domestic plants. They are the product of black oil sunflower seeds from bird food. Um, they, they've been Online, if you research it, they, they, you'll get information that says that they're a Western species. But then at the same time, you get information that will show that the Native Americans in the Southeast are the ones who domesticated the species. So it's kind of hard to tell with the annual sunflowers. But there are many perennial sunflowers that we should be focusing on instead. I kind of leave the sunflowers up just because, as you can see, they're great for our generalist pollinators. They always are full of different kinds of bees. Um, and the, the songbirds do love them. The goldfinches come in, the chickadees come in, the nuthatches, the woodpeckers, they all come in and they feed off the sunflowers. But um, the perennial sunflowers are very important, especially for the migration of monarch butterflies. Our perennial sunflowers like Helianthus maximiliani, maximilian sunflower, that's what I'm trying to show. So this is maximilian sunflower. Um, I cut a lot of it back because it gets so tall and I didn't want it to flop this year. So I cut it back a couple weeks ago and it's starting to regrow. So he, this is a perennial species of sunflower. It comes back every year and it blooms in September. And it, like I said, it's very important for our late season nectar source for our pollinators, especially for our monarch butterflies who are traveling from Canada down to Mexico. It's very important for them to get seeds uh, for nectar. This is our native canada lily for people who want to grow lilies it, as long as you're not in deer country at least there's two or three different species of native lilies that you can choose from to replace your exotic asiatic lilies any other questions um yes uh there's a question since i planted some veggies too if i plant milkweed for the monarch would the aphids in the milkweed be invading my veggies i would keep your vegetable bed separate from any native plant bed you're making um with that said you will get better fruit set and higher higher um pollination rates by incorporating native plants into your gardens um especially if you're oh let me show you before sorry a little distraction but there is a milkweed bug on that seed pod right there and that is actually your friend when you see these guys because what they do is they feed on your milkweed seeds to prevent them from becoming overly weedy and living up to their name of being a weed so so i would and also it depends on the species you know if you were going to put a couple of butterfly weed around the border of your vegetable garden, I would say fine, but I wouldn't plant common milkweed in with your with your vegetables because like I said earlier, it will just take over that bed. Do you feel like there's a lot of um, native vegetables for planting? Uh, um, well, no, there's a lot of edibles that you can incorporate. So the beach plums, you know, the sunflowers is one is a great example, sunflowers. Echinacea is used as medicinal, you know, medicinally for, for skin issues and different things like that. The roots, or you can make teas. Um, the, the beach plum is an edible. I 
don't have any fruit. Oh, no, we're having a bad year this year. Oh, here's one. Here we go. All right, so it's little, but here's one little beach plum. They will get bigger as the plant matures. So this is another one where I planted just as much for me as I did for the wildlife. Because this is, beach plum would be growing not in the middle of Nassau County where I am. It would be growing along the coastal sand dunes. So it's a little out of place where I am, but I incorporated it because I wanted to also eat a native plum. So you got beach plums as native. Um, the wild bee bomb back here, you can make a tea out of it. The eastern prickly pear cactus is edible, both the pads themselves and the fruit. The, these are the fruits. They turn red throughout the as the summer progresses. Oh. And um, you can eat the you can eat the fruit and you can eat the pads. The pads kind of taste like string beans. You just have to get the uh, the the hairs off them, the stinging hairs, the glow kids, and then they're safe to eat. Um, the nodding wild onions are actually edible. Both the entire plant's edible, but mostly you would harvest the foliage and use it kind of like a green onion. Um, let's see what else we have. I have a persimmon tree right there that I'm trying to keep dwarf. So that's a persimmon, an American persimmon, because we have to specify that's an American persimmon. Um, so that is edible as well. You can see I have a few figs. Those are not native, but those I'm Italian, so we planted some figs. Um, the the berries, the blueberries are native. There are native black cap raspberries that I grow. The ostrich ferns in here, when they grow in the spring, you can eat the fiddleheads. The blueberries, um, different kinds of blackberries. You have both low bush and high bush blueberry that you can grow to eat. Um, I have a American hazelnut where I got my first nut this year growing. So right here is my first American hazelnut nut ever. So that's another native edible that you can be growing. Um, if you wanna know more about edible plants that are native, um, you can research indigenous landscapes. That is a website. It's, a, it's also a book they recently came out with and that talks more about incorporating perennial native plants into our agricultural food systems which is also something I'm very interested in as a permaculturist. And I also, you know, I go with a little bit of uh, our history being on Long Island. I also incorporate, this is our native Long Island cheese pumpkin, which is a domestic food crop, but it, it's our Native American um, variety of pumpkin that originated here on Long Island, so that I consider that native, even though it's a it's a vegetable crop. I like to grow this every year to get some cheese pumpkins for some Thanksgiving pie, and um, that helps also with our squash bees. So, incorporating native plants, like if you grow tomatoes, a lot of people love growing tomatoes on Long Island, but unless we're providing habitat for our bumblebees, we're really not giving anything back to them, and they're giving us all of you know they're the ones pollinating our tomatoes for us. So unless you stop putting down chemicals on the soil. Most of our bumblebees are soil dwellers. They nest underground. I have a nest behind that arborvitae in the corner. There's actually a bumblebee nest in there. Um, so by providing native species that help support bumblebees, you can provide more habitat for the bumblebees and give back to them for giving us all those juicy tomatoes every summer. Hmm. Very nice. There are actually um oh there are two more. Um do you do you get poison ivy in your garden? No, um I do not get poison ivy. I am pretty surprised that I haven't gotten poison ivy yet growing in the garden, just because I have a lot of fruit eating birds. And that's one thing that you'll notice is that the only weeds I really get in my garden are either brought in by squirrels and it's it's like an oak tree or a hickory nut that they planted or it's a fruit um, producing plant such as you know maybe there's an open space and, and a pokeberry did germinate or it's a mulberry or it's a porcelain berry that one of our native birds ate the fruit and brought the, the seed in in their droppings and left me 
a porcelain berry that I had to pull out of the garden. But for the most part, I have never had poison ivy growing on the property, knock on wood. But um, that is another native plant. It's just not great to have around people. And how do you keep the wild cherry small? I just cut it back really hard. Um, the first year, what happened was I didn't want it there at all, so I cut it back. And and I do this. I did the same thing with the uh, persimmon. You can see, I cut it. Get a better view. I cut it down low, so I cut it about knee high. There's a book, How to Grow a Little Fruit Tree. I forget who who wrote write it. Who wrote it? She um she's out in California, I believe. She's a nursery woman, and she wrote a book about how to keep your fruit trees dwarfed. And so you can have way more fruit trees on your property than most people would think. So I kind of did the similar thing with this where I, I tried to cut it down originally and it kind of grew back. And instead of growing back as a tree, it grew back more of a small shrub. And here oh. is a little cherry. Again, oh, it's wow. not a great year because we have, there's, oh, here we go. There's not a lot of moisture this year. So so these are going to turn dark black and they're sour, they're seedy, but they make great jam or juice if you're going to if you're going to grow them for fruit production. They they um you would grow that for jam or something like that because they're a little sour to eat straight up. And we got a little spider. So this is another thing where how you maintain your garden is is what's going to lead to what kind of um pest control you have. So I have dragonflies everywhere every day i have here actually there's a dragonfly right here um so on top of this yucca i don't know if you can see there's a dragonfly can you guys see the dragonfly oh yeah yeah so so there's always dragonflies in the garden i have tons of different kinds of spiders jumping spiders funnel web spiders garden spiders orb weavers wolf spiders grass spiders i have so many different kinds of spiders um lady beetles lace wings tons of wasps and again they don't bother you they just want to go about their business and do what they do naturally and that's run around and eat aphids and eat caterpillars and eat crickets and just do their thing so this is the baptisia i brought up earlier it has very ornamental seed pods this is a near native. Again, it's native to the Midwest and a little more south than us. It's not a native plant to Long Island, but it's grown extensively as a native ornamental. Virginia creeper is another staple ground cover in my garden just because it's it was aggressive enough that it allowed me to take over like a lot of space quickly and it keeps out all the other weeds that I may not want to grow in the garden. So here's another winter berry i have a couple dwarf cultivars because again i wanted to be able to plant as much as i could this is walter's barnyard grass that i grew from seed very interesting it's flowering actually i don't know if you can see the yellow in the seed in the in the coming out of the uh little things there so this little yellow anther so this is actually flowering and hasn't gone to seed yet this is indian grass indian grass flowers this already flowered it's on its way to ripening into seed Oh, Julia well, had a uh, question. She's asking, um, is Virginia creeper native? Yes, Virginia creeper is native to, I'm pretty sure, most of the eastern United States. And can you recommend something to grow in the space between the sidewalk and the street? Yes. So you want to stick with low growing plants, but you also want to focus on something that if it gets stepped on, it won't be a problem. Um, the number one recommendation would be creeping flocks. So here's some creeping flocks. A lot of people grow creeping flocks and don't even realize it's a native plant. So creeping flocks, you know, it stays low, it's evergreen, and you can fill out, you could actually, that's actually what I'm planning on doing this 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 fall. I'm gonna rip out, I let the lawn die in both spots pretty much just because I'm gonna plant over everything with some creeping, flocks some pink uh some purple love grass and a couple other plants that i haven't chosen yet but um i just want to show you real quick another option is you can see how the grass died back but this is creeping yarrow so i showed you the white yarrow flowers the white flowers here 
and they're starting to brown up over there. Those that's creeping yarrow. So creeping yarrow is another one where you could actually just seed this directly into your lawn and it'll creep out. It can be mowed on, it can be walked on. It's very soft. And it, it will flower, but most likely not if you're gonna mow it. But um that's another great one where if you want a native lawn type situation that you can walk on, creeping yarrow is my number one go to because you can walk all over that and it, it won't be affected so much. That's Achillea millifolium. Thank you uh, so much for joining us today, Anthony, and for showing us this uh, amazing garden. Um, yeah. Thank does you. anybody else have any questions or comments you wanted to make, you can unmute yourself before we uh, go. Thank you so very much. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Glad to How get the word out. Sorry? I said, come again. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Yes, I will. I will. I will. As long as they, if you guys keep calling me, I'll keep coming. Yeah, I'm whatever. Say thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a terrific presentation. You're a fountain of knowledge. Um, thank you for the tour. Thank you, Anthony, and thanks for everybody for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.